Okay, so I'll get started now. Uh, today I'm trying to help you put the pieces together from the first seven weeks of class uh, and so that you kind of understand how all these pieces fit together. Uh, what we're talking about is the concept of legality, so more than just law as an object, uh, all ways that we kind of think about law and legality. And then I'm placing that within critical race theory, help you understand the difference between segregation, assimilation, anti-racism, and white cultural supremacy. This is part of the diversity symposium this month uh, and the anti-racism uh, equity summit. So some key terms to help you understand the context is critical race theory is a framework that points out that law, power, and rights typically exclude African Americans and other minority groups from power. A segregationist is someone who believes that enslaved Africans and other non-whites could never become uh, citizens, or we the people, they're not in included in that idea of democracy. Uh, this is most famously argued by Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Taney, uh, but many people who were explicit in this belief, they said this out loud uh, up until the Civil War, uh, now people believe this, but they might not necessarily say it out loud, making it a little bit trickier to figure out what people believe. Uh, most people believe uh, that, that people should assimilate, uh, and so these are assimilationists. You can hear this in kind of the way people talk in the media, uh, how politicians talk, and how a lot of professors talk. Uh, so they believe that enslaved Africans and other non-whites could be taught to be people. So there's still a lot of racism going on there. A uh, pretty famous example was Thomas Jefferson, and essentially this is achieved by acting white. You could call it code switching. There's all sorts of other ways of thinking about it, but idea that you have to change who you are in order to fit into another group. Anti-racism, on the other hand, is one who is expressing the idea that racial groups are equals and that no one, no r racial groups need developing of any kind, uh, and you support the idea that reduces racial inequity. So you can't be anti-racist and be an assimilationist. You can't be anti-racist and be a segregationist. You'd have to commit to being anti-racist. White cultural supremacy is the system or a system of domination, domination whereby individuals behave as if white is a superior standard to which all others must adjust. So you'll see that in both the segregationist and the assimilationist attitudes, people believe that white is the place that everyone should become. They take that for granted. They assume everybody should behave the same way, uh, and therefore they are not anti-racist. To try to understand how this applies to the judiciary or how judges make decisions, we have to think about this historically first and what we mean by sovereignty. So in quest for legal sovereignty, you'll learn that that concept itself, what people think that concept means, is what constitutes our legal identities. So in order, this is from the reading, in order for any minority group to enjoy the full import of its rights in our success-oriented society, it must fern obtain economic self-sufficiency. Here, this is an assimilationist attitude. This is not an anti-racist attitude. It's an assimilation attitude. It is almost a segregation attitude where it says a minority group to enjoy its rights. So that's not our rights. That's separating each group. Uh, I think what they're seeing is in this argument, this lawyer is saying that you go from segregation to assimilation uh, by changing your behaviors. So this means that minorities have to assimilate into the majority ways of living and making sense of the world. In this case, the way that the lawyers are making sense of the world and they're being forced to change who they are and what they value. The historical fact of this that we saw was in the 1800s with the policy, the government policy, the Congress passed a law and then the president executed that law, uh, forcing Indians to remove from their territories, from where they were living, and forcing them all into one place called the reservation and this started the reservation system uh, in the United States. So here they're saying that because Indians could not assimilate, segregation wasn't working because there was wars. So what they did was they forced them to go into their own area, uh, which was obviously not the place they were living. It was a place that was created for them uh, to be separate from everyone else. Uh, many, 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 many people died on what's called the Trail of Tears, uh, where Indians were forced to go from one place to the other. 
uh, there is a large amount of evidence to suggest that this was in fact the intent uh, of the United States government, was that people would die uh, and that was better than, than giving people full equality under the law. Now, how does this apply to you? Well, in the reading behavior theory of organizations, this is talking about your ability to make change. So you've got the mega organization, which would be the legal uh, system. And then we've got kind of all the minor systems underneath that. So if you think about this from a social group perspective, you think about your social network, uh, how you are uh, Addicted is a strong word, but how you use that every day, right? You look at your social network, you watch your friends, your influence. This is changes how you make your decisions. It changes how you think about the world. It changes how uh, what you think is important. This is true of all of us in all of our social groups, whether they're on the internet or here in real life. Uh, it limits your choices, meaning that you know you only see certain things. You don't see everything in the world, and so you think those things are more important than they probably are. It frames your values. It makes you think this is what other people think is important. We tend to generalize that and think everybody thinks these things are important when in fact that's not statistically accurate. And then it gives us shortcuts to try to assimilate. We try to fit in with these groups. We post similar pictures. Uh, we like certain things on social media. Uh, and this is again influencing how we make our decisions. So what this really means is any social group we're in, whether it's professional, whether it's casual, whether it's in school, uh, these provide tools or the means to an end, tools that help us unknowingly churn our daily routines into our regular habits. And so this very much influences how we think. So the main point here is that how you make decisions, what you think is important, what you think is legal or illegal, or what you think you should follow or resist, these are influenced by our social structures. And this is how you make sense of law is either domination as resistance or as a game. So I give you these pictures here because these are three different social group narratives about the same event. So the event is the Black Lives Matter movement. Okay, so some people understood that movement as an empowerment movement, especially for young people, that they could embrace their future and that the problem was that young people, young black people were being targeted by white police and that in order for this to change, they needed to have a proactive movement. And so you see that represented in the picture with children participating in protests. On the other hand, people associated this with riots, right? So you see the false news, the fake news, saying that there was a study that Black Lives Matter would link to 91% of riots. Uh, academically, research-wise, empirically, realistically, back here on planet Earth, uh, no study could ever prove such a thing. That's impossible. That's not something that science can prove. Uh, a relationship between crime, riots, and protests, because riots are uh, a particular criminal activity, and then protests are completely different. And so just saying those things doesn't make it true. However, in this social network, this is how those people interpreted the event of Black Lives Matter. And then finally, the third period, uh, picture here is a symbol of black power, and yet it comes from London. So this could be easily misperceived by Americans, right? Because they don't know the context. And so the context has different meanings. These were uh, in response to activities that were going on in London. And so you see three different social groups having three different ways of controlling their own narratives. So there's no such thing as law. There's no such thing as illegal, right? It's how that group decides what it is. So why does this matter? Legal terms are socially constructed. They're not universal. They don't mean the same thing to everybody. So if you look at the image in the upper right, over 50% of the United States thought that this was an insurrection. Notice how they didn't use the word riot. Very strange, right? So riot apparently means when people of color protest. When white people protest, they call it an insurrection. Some people call it a rebellion. However, on the lower right, this is not a riot, it's not an insurrection, it's not a rebellion, but it's just as destructive. The ch context changes because this one's on the football field, whereas the other one's at the United States Capitol. So when we're looking at an action, one ordinarily in the law, you say a murder is a murder is a murder. Somebody kills somebody, that's a murder. However, in this legal term, it's unclear what the meaning of the term is. It doesn't apply equally to all groups and to all situations. Another example is there's no such thing in law as an illegal person. 
but people use this phrase all the time. They say illegal immigrant. There's no such thing. It doesn't make any sense in the law. A person can't be illegal. Actions are illegal, and there's no criminal action that an immigrant can take that would create them to be an illegal person. And yet, look how we use the law. Again, that's social groups, right? I've never heard a lawyer ever say illegal immigrant. I've never, I've read judges who have used it in response to what they're being argued by social groups, but it's not a legal term, but it used, it's used like it's a legal term. And so people start to understand it as a, a legal term. So they make their decisions based on whether they believe this thing is true. The most important thing here is that crimes are defined by the dominant social group then. And so they have the luxury of saying one thing is a crime where the other thing is not. So they say rioting is a crime, but the rebellion is not. So if you go to Ferguson, Missouri, if people were engaged in this kind of behavior on the upper right or the lower right, they would all go to jail. However, in the capital uh, situation here, you've got only a handful of people went to jail. The rest did not, even though they participated in the criminal activity of breaking and entering. Here you have a bunch of individuals who didn't go to jail or were even arrested, even though they're participating in the destruction of property. Because it's the social group that gets to decide what a crime is or isn't. It's not based on the dictionary def definition. It's based on what the social group actually wants to use as a crime. So because not everybody agrees to how these definitions work, many people don't even understand how they work, and we don't really think too much about how the stereotypes and labels actually work in our day of life, then you're not going to have a common definition of crime. And it's going to be used unequally, and it's going to be used by the dominant group to try to force minority groups to submit. So we want to think about it in this context. On the left-hand corner here, you have three big categories that influence judges. You have education, they go to law school. So these ideas they have about law are learned through the law school experience. If you didn't go to law school, you're unlikely to share the same ideas that judges do. You're getting a little bit of that experience here in this class. You're learning what kind of things lawyers and judges learn in law school. But that's me sharing my experience going through law school with you. So I'm bringing you into that education on the professional professional side right you and i aren't judges and so we don't participate in the practices and routines and share ideas with judges i interview and i talk to judges so i get some idea i interview and i talk with lawyers and so i get some idea right but if you're not engaged in that social network it's going to be hard for you to have the same meaning about concepts as judges and lawyers do the final piece that all judges and lawyers are always thinking about is the appeals process. Their decisions can be appealed. So they don't make law, they don't make decisions, they make a decision about a particular area within the law, usually about a process or a rule, and then that's always something that can be overturned, it can be appealed, and so this is part of their organization, it's like their chain of command. There's always somebody that can say they're wrong. So they're always thinking about this process. We, on the other hand, right, somebody can argue with us, but they don't overrule us. We don't go to the grocery store and say, I think this cereal is the best. And then somebody comes and said, no, you're not allowed to buy that cereal. So we don't tend to think like this, whereas judges do. So some basic concepts that judges refer to a lot in their writing opinions that you have to think about is liberty. And that's going to mean different to you different to a social science professor, different to a uh, person on the street, different than a person who works in a grocery store. Everybody's going to have a different concept of liberty, but judges are going to apply a judicial concept of liberty. Posterity, meaning how does this affect future generations? Again, that's going to be different for judges because it's how they use the term in their legal opinions. Equal application, separation of powers, defending individuals and supporting legislation, these all mean different things to judges. What's important to understand here is that judges tend to support legislation. So there's a lot of misconceptions or a lot of confusion, I guess, out on the internet where judges make law. That's incorrect. In the United States, judges do not make law, not even close. Legislatures make law. In fact, judges tend to defer to legislatures, meaning they tend to agree with the legislature, even when it harms individuals, even when it violates their rights. The courts tend to overwhelmingly support what the legislature said. Even when they rule a law unconstitutional, they don't change the law. 
they send it back to the legislature. They send it back to Congress and say, you need to rewrite this law so that it's not unconstitutional. And so judges are not participating in this lawmaking function in the United States. It's Congress, 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 and the state and local legislatures. And so this idea about defending individuals, if you look carefully at Judge Downing in Anderson County and look carefully at Justice Kennedy in uh, Texas versus Lawrence, they're not protect, uh, protecting individuals as a single person. They're saying they want to put a, a benefit or they want to put an emphasis on individual rights. So they're keying or they're suggesting or telling the legislature that you're violating individual rights. So if you want to have a law, you cannot violate individual rights. This doesn't mean that the legislature is going to listen to them. That's separation of powers. They don't have to listen to them. But it does mean that that's the way that the judges are thinking. These are the most important restrictions, the constraints, right, that are what judges are dealing with. They also have some opportunities to kind of play around with these definitions that applies to legal cases, but that's a huge difference than from how we tend to think about these issues. So the two questions you wanna think about in your final papers and in your final exam is why do judges tend to think about assimilation, remember those three terms, according to the behavioral theory of organizations and quest for legal sovereignty? The answer is because that's what law school teaches. That's the professional understanding. Lawyers and judges want the whole world to think like them. And then finally, this is part of the organization of judges. Judges are not revolutionaries. They're not leading protests. They're not out there fighting for individual rights. They're sitting in their chambers, in their robes, reading laws. Right? That's what they do. And so that's their norms. That's their behavior. That's the world they live in. So when we want them to do these outrageous superhero type things, right, we're really asking for something that's probably impossible. Then we want to think about why do the terms, each of these terms, why do they mean different things, right? Why does that, what, like, these are words, right? You would think that they would have some commonality. So why do minority groups experience these phrases, experience these terms differently? It's not because they have a different understanding of dictionaries, right? Everybody's reading the same uh, words. It's how they're experiencing it in the world. People are using these terms differently. A lot of times in America, people are using individual liberty to harm collective groups. So it's saying, I have the right to get you sick with COVID. That doesn't make sense, right? That's not a logical way to think. But when you start thinking like this legally, you start thinking, I only care about my rights. And so again, that's a, a dangerous way that is assimilation. It's trying to get everybody to behave the same way. It's certainly not anti-equity or anti-racism. So if we conclude, right, if anti-racism is the idea that we're all equal, that we don't need to change anybody, we don't need to develop anything, we must support ideas and policies that reduce racial inequity, not increase them, right? So we have to support ways of thinking that help each other actually live equitably in real life. An anti-racist legal system, now this is complicated because there's 50 different state courts plus all the local courts, plus the federal courts, plus international courts. So all of those courts would have to be organized to be anti-racist. It's not impossible, they're all organized to be racist, so it's possible that they could be anti-racist, but you'd have to start by centering the experience of minorities. So the minority experience would have to be the organizing factor. It'd have to be the thing that everybody is agreeing on. They're saying, we're gonna make sure that minorities have equity. If each of the courts did that, I guarantee you'd start to see people behave differently. But this would also involve listening to those with different meanings of legal concepts. So if people are experiencing liberty or they're experiencing equity or separation of powers differently, we have to listen to those. We have to include those meanings. We can't discount them and say, no, you have to change your mind and think like me. And then finally, you'd have to empower minority groups to actually use legal procedures that represent their own values and ways of making meaning. That means they might have alternative forms of conflict re resolution. Most of these legal systems come from a very small part of England from the 1600s. So the whole world doesn't settle their conflicts the same way that English people from the 1600s did. I'm not even sure English people settle their conflicts the same way now that they did in the 1600s. But for some reason in the United States, people are very aggressive with trying to keep that same way of doing things. That's racist, right? That's an idea that your way of doing things is better than everybody else. 
likely because it benefits those groups. Those white men power holders are the ones who benefit from those systems. And so you'd have to change those procedures to match what people actually want them to be. So you'd have to have people participate in designing the legal system, not just doing what it says.